John Harmer has a wonderful passion and skill for obtaining color from fungi from dyed yarns, silks, hand spun skeins, knitted and crocheted items. So she has been using fungi for color for many, many years. Um, you're from the Sunshine Coast, Anne, and you love to explore the rainforests there, I believe. Um, <laughs> and therefore, you're searching for many different kinds of fungi, different species, and you're experimenting them for different colors and that sort of thing, um, from what I understand. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you've also taught many different types of dyeing workshops for clubs and just private workshops for knitting clubs and all kinds of things, I believe, and from Vancouver all the way to Toronto, and now on Vancouver Island. Um, great. And in 2016, you and a group of like-minded folks were able to organize and invite the International Symposium for Fungi and Fiber, or the International Symposium, yeah, Fungi and Fiber? Fungi and Fiber, fungi and fiber Symposium, yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, and then you actually held an event there in 2016. Yeah amazing um and also you've written a book it's called magic in the dye pot and it's available on your blog and your website which is mm -hmm. shroomwork.com um which is wonderful and i will have all of that information the link to your blog and other resources for local fungal dyeing related resources tomorrow morning so that'll kind Hopefully. of all blend together but for today that that it goes off to you now and it's all yours Okay, thank you very much. I will proceed to do what has to be done so you can see my presentation. I want to thank David for helping to walk me through this to make it happen. Um, we'll just... There it comes. All and right, there That's we go. It. Beautiful. Right. Yeah. Okay, so so thank you to SPIMS for inviting me to talk about mushroom dyeing. Um, this is the first time I haven't done it face to face, so it's a bit different for me. Um, but I'm always glad to talk about this subject. Um, I hope you're prepared to stay until midnight or so because I could carry on for hours. Um, only joking there. I I haven't always been involved in mushroom dyeing. Um, like many North American children, I grew up being told, don't touch a mushroom, it's going to kill you. And in fact, I, I believed this until I was in my 40s. Um, I would approach mushrooms cautiously, keep my distance, take a few pictures, but never touch them. And then in 2003, I was living in, in Vancouver my dearest and I decided to move to the Sunshine Coast. And knowing that we were going to be living adjacent to Crown Land and a beautiful rainforest, I thought I should probably learn a little bit about mushrooms. Um, and so I, I took a, a workshop in basic mushroom ID at Van Dusen Gardens and I was gobsmacked. There were so many mushrooms, different colors, different shapes, sizes, it was just, it was an amazing world and um, the presenters were actually picking them up, smelling them, tasting them and weren't dying from it. So I thought, yes, it's time to learn. Um, in, in doing so, in looking for information, a website came up that talked about color from mushrooms and it was from, I believe from Norway or Denmark, the Fungi and Fiber Symposium. At the time, that meant nothing to me. I wasn't involved in fiber arts. And I just thought, these are a bunch of weirdos. And I moved on. <laughs> I didn't pay attention to it. And it was only a few years later, after I joined the Sunshine Coast Spinners and Weavers here on the coast and started experimenting with natural dyes, that somehow this website came up again in my, in my researching. And then it meant something to me. And at the same time, I joined an email forum back before the days of Facebook. And someone mentioned dying with mushrooms and, and uh, I learned a bit about it and uh, started experimenting with it. And so I, I began, explore, this is my backyard. I began exploring the forest behind me, collecting what I could find, learning more about it. 
and uh, I did a little bit of dyeing and I was amazed at these beautiful colors. Anyone who does natural dyeing knows that we get a lot of yellows and browns and maybe golds using flowers and leaves and roots and grasses, but not too many other colors. And so I thought this was just wonderful. Um, so through this forum, somebody mentioned that the next meeting uh, or the next conference, the Fungi and Fiber Symposium, is going to be held in Mendocino. And this was in 2008 by this time. And I still wasn't sure if I should go. I still thought, no, this is really weird. But it was my daughter who said, Mom, what are the chances? Both passions in one meeting. And my husband said, you're going. And so I did. And immediately when I walked in among these people, I just, I felt at home. And I knew these are my people. And everyone was there to spend a week learning about getting color from mushrooms. And so I realized there was so much to learn. And the first thing I learned was about Miriam Rice, who started this whole mushroom dyeing movement in the 1970s. And it's a lovely story, actually. She, she was an artist, a fine artist in Mendocino and did classes for children. And she was uh, doing classes in natural dyes and went out one day for a walk and found this lovely little clump of yellow mushrooms. She didn't know what they were, but she decided to pick them and take them back to draw, to draw them. And she had a dye pot waiting. She was getting ready to do a, a dyeing class for the children. And she had this moment where she thought, I wonder what if, what would happen if I threw these into the dye pot? And fortunately for us, these um, sulfur tufts, Hyphaloma fasciculare, are one, in, one of the few mushrooms that give good color. And she got a nice yellow color from these and it just sent her on a, on a completely new journey. She started learning about mushrooms. She joined the San Francisco Mycological Society. She um, did, she died, she tried every mushroom she could find to see if she could get color from it. And she wrote, this lovely little book. This was in 1974. And it's Let's, Let's Try Mushrooms for Color. And it's one of these delightful books from the 1970s with the brown paper cover, mostly pen and ink drawings and some, some uh, color, color images as well. And really encouraging people to try to try this new way of dying, and her illustrator was Dorothy Beebe, who had done scientific illustrations as a freelance career, and it was just such a good fit that Dorothy went on to illustrate Miriam's other books, because um, in in 1980 she had learned much more, and published this book, Mushrooms for Color. And she, uh, in, in her research, somehow her book made its way to Scandinavia and a Swedish chemist had also been looking into the chemical properties of a mushroom there that gave good color. And someone suggested that they should correspond. And so they started sending samples and, and letters back and forth. And this was in the days when you had to pull out a piece of paper and write something on it and put it in an envelope with a stamp and mail it. So you can imagine the correspondence was much slower than what we're used to now. But they were excited about it. And in the meantime, Miriam had other artists in Mendocino who were trying this. And so they, they decided they had to get together. And I'm just going to have to check here that the first meeting was in 1980, and it was called the International Mushroom Dyed Textile Show, Fungi and Fiber. And they had such a great time, and everybody learned so much that they decided they would have to 
have another, another meeting. And so in 1982, they met again, um, the second national, well, this is national mushroom dyes. And then 1983, the International Fungus and Fiber Symposium, which was held in Sweden. And then from then they had it roughly every two years. They met in Denmark in 1985, Mendocino, Norway, Scotland in 1993, Sweden again in 1997, they met in the United States in New York, Norway again in 1999, Finland, Australia in 2003. They actually do, do have some mushrooms in parts of Australia. And um, back to Denmark in 2005 and then 2008 in Mendocino. So when I, um, when I got there, I also learned that Miriam had written another book, Mushrooms for Dyes, Paper, Pigments, and Mycosticks, again, illustrated by Dorothy Beebe. And this has become a sort of Bible for mushroom dyers everywhere. She goes into much more detail. And in, in, in the meantime, she had also experimented with making paper from mushrooms, um, using the pigments to make watercolors and wax crayons and pastels. And um, so this book was launched at that meeting in Mendocino, and it was also the occasion of her 90th birthday. So it was a grand event, and this was my first my first leap into mushroom dyeing. I had the privilege of sitting next to Miriam at lunch one day, and she was delightful. She never stopped talking, and she was so welcoming and so encouraging. And, and I remember the main thing that she stressed was, don't be afraid to try. Just try something. You know, if you think it might work, try it. You have nothing to lose. And so uh, you'll remember my little samples of color that I showed you that I was so proud of. Well, I had brought these to Mendocino for the exhibit area because registrants were asked to bring exhibits. And I, I thought these people are gonna be blown away by these Canadian colors. <laughs> and I walked into the exhibit area the next day and this is what it looked like. And there was so much talent and obvious artistry among these registrants from all over the world. And um, that's, that took me down a peg or two. That's when I knew I have a lot to learn. So um, we had workshops, all kinds of workshops. I, I was able to attend a workshop with Miriam here. Whoops. And lots of color. The dye pots were going every day. These events last for four or five days. And every day there were dye pots out on the deck. And this, these were the colors that resulted by the end of the week. And uh, so it was announced that the next meeting was going to be held in Sweden. Oh, I seem to have missed something. I'm sorry. Um, maybe we'll come to that in a bit. Um, I went to Sweden and Spain and Estonia in the meantime, but coming back home after that meeting, I decided I had to really try what I was doing with mushrooms. And so I gathered mushrooms everywhere I could find in the forest and the dye pots were going nonstop. And these were the colors that resulted from one season of dyeing. And you can see um, there's a lot of gold there. I'll explain where that comes from later. Um, it's, yeah, a lot of gold. And then some good reds and some other colors. My palette has expanded a bit since then. But I did discover that like natural dyes, mushroom dyes go together. It, it's, I, I just chose these colors at random and they all go together so beautifully. At this time I was using primarily commercial yarn, yarn that I bought already spun um, and just to make the samples. And I felt I had to redeem myself. So I decided to make a cardigan using a bit of each color that I had obtained that year. 
So this was the sweater I made for myself to show a sunset on the front and colors of the forest on the back. Uh, and here we are, Sweden, 2010. Um, it, it was, again, many of the same people, everyone there for a week to spend a week with gathering and dying with mushrooms. And the forests there are quite open. They're managed forests. The cut blocks are in rectangles. And a lot of the planting is done in straight rows. So it was quite different from what I was used to. But we had dye pots going outside. This was an old traditional wash tub that's um, fueled with wood. And we had many lovely artistic pieces, creations that uh, people brought with them. And uh, they actually had a fashion show for us. And you'll see a lot of the brighter reds in the pieces. These are generally from the Nordic people, the Scandinavian countries. There's a, a mushroom that grows in abundance further north and um, they take great advantage of it. And um, lots of people there just to have fun. You'll see some of these faces from year to year. I always tell people, if you go to one symposium, you'll want to go to everyone after that. Everybody just enjoys it so much. And it's wonderful to, see, to get together with people again and see what they've been doing in the last two years. This lady here, I believe, went to the very first symposium or certainly one of the very early ones. She's from Sweden. And here she had a bicycle powered felting machine and she would ride around the grounds on her bicycle with this, um, wool inside rolling around to felt it. Whoops, it's going a little too fast here, excuse me. Um, 2012, it was in Spain and somebody had to represent Canada. So I went, spent some time in Barcelona and we were up near the Pyrenees close to the border with France. And it had been a very dry year that year, that this is what the forest looked like. It was a pine forest, very few mushrooms. Then this was in early September. Um, and in fact, I, I remember there was one rusula that somebody found and there were 10 or 12 people surrounding it just <laughs> examining this one mushroom because it was, it was a rarity for that year. It was, it was unfortunate. But uh, everybody, was again there to have a good time. There were some beautiful things brought to the exhibit hall. In the bottom right, um, you'll see cards that one of our members uh, paints with mushroom pigments with watercolors. Um, and it's quite beautiful work. In 2014, we went to Estonia. And this time the Canadian representation was tripled. We had three people who went and uh, it was very interesting. It was a really interesting country to visit. It's very easy to be a tourist in Estonia. And we felt welcomed wherever we went. We spent some time in Tallinn and I would advise not going there during cruise ship season. We were there a little bit after that, but you could see the effects of the crowds that must have um, must have happened in the summer when the ships were in. Again, the forest is quite open. This is typical of their forest. Um, open and level and flat. It was a good year though. It was a very good year for mushrooms. And in our residence, which was a ski resort, there was one little hill off to the side um, where people went skiing in the winter and it was filled with dehydrators, people putting things outside their doors at night and the mushroom display was quite, um, quite abundant. And again, the colors, they just kept appearing over the course of the week and we had some beautiful displays of color there. So people had been asking me over the years if we would consider having the symposium in Canada. 
And where I live, it's a small village on the Sunshine Coast, Madeira Park. And at the time, we just didn't have the accommodation space, no public transport. But in the meantime, um, shortly before this, this symposium in Estonia, a new resort hotel was built in Madeira Park, very close to our downtown village. And so talking it over with my fellow spinners and weavers and the members of our mushroom club, we decided we could manage it. And so in Estonia, we put our name forward to hold the next meeting in 2016. And we held it in Madeira Park. Um, and we had 150 international visitors in our small village. We had to um, arrange accommodation. Once the, this resort downtown was filled, we had to arrange accommodation outside the village and transportation was a challenge because we still don't have public transit up here. But we managed, it was a fabulous event. And I think a lot of people were really taken with our temperate rainforests here. Um, a lot of them had never seen anything quite so lush as this. And fortunately, it was a fabulous year for mushrooms. Um, the autumn rains came early and they were plentiful. And by the time we met in the middle of October, the mushrooms were just abundant and it was, it was really fabulous. And again, the exhibit space showed some amazing creations and um, everybody left with smiles on their faces. And that's what we wanted to happen. Um, it was just a fabulous event. Uh, so I'm now I'm going to talk about the process of getting color from mushrooms. I generally dye with, with unspent fiber that looks like this. Um, and then I can spin it and I can play with the colors and blend them. People generally um, use commercial yarn though, yarn that's already made. And that is easier to work with and less likely to felt. Um, the, the process is pretty much the same as with any natural dyeing. Um, you collect the material and if it's if mushrooms are dried, the general rule is that you use one part by weight of mushrooms and one part of fiber. Um, if using fresh, then it's a little bit harder to get a ratio. But um, I, if I am using fresh, I just I cook them up and judge the color that I have, and then put in what I think is the appropriate amount of fiber. Um, if you have done any natural dyeing, you'll know that it's necessary to use a mordant in most cases. And a mordant is a mineral salt that attaches to the fiber. You process the fiber first with that, and then that allows the color molecule to attach to it. It sort of acts as a bridge between the color and the fiber. And um, alum is the safest and most readily available to do. Um, it's a matter of, of cooking the wool or silk fiber in a, in a bath of alum. And uh, it, that attaches to the fiber. And then after that's dried, you can use that in the mushrooms. Other mordants that can be used are iron, which uh, darkens the color, gives it a richer, darker cast. And I have used copper in the past. I don't use that that much anymore. The dark brown on the top left is uh, a copper mordanted fiber. It's a bit tricky to dispose of. It's not the safest thing to dispose of, I have learned, because if it gets into the water system, it's lethal to young fish. Um, and so I don't usually recommend that one uses it. In the, in the 70s, in the time when Miriam Rice wrote her first book, people were also using chrome and zinc and um, tin as mordants. And those are pretty much frowned upon now because they are dangerous to use. And uh, it's, 
it's really considered not necessary, although they do give some brilliant bright colors. Uh, I use protein fibers primarily, silk and wool. You can also use llama, dog hair, um, but they do pick up the color best. Uh, cellulose fibers, the plant fibers like linen and cotton can be used to dye. Um, they require extra treatment and they don't pick up the colors as brilliantly. So now I am going to, to go through the mushrooms in more or less chronological order as I find them here in the rainforest. Um, and it's, it's surprising how most of these mushrooms are found on the other side of the world, also in the temperate zones. There are some that, that grow elsewhere that I don't get here. And I think there's some that grow here on the West Coast that aren't found in Europe, but most of them are um, common in, in the various temperate forests in the Northern hemisphere anyway. I don't think very much has been done with tropical mushrooms. I think that's a whole area that would be fascinating to explore to see what kind of color potential is available in mushrooms of tropical areas. So the first one I find, Pycnoporellus fulgens, is just a little yellow uh, polypore that grows on here on fallen Douglas fir, dead Douglas fir, almost always in association with the red belted conch, the Fomatopsis panicola. And um, when I was first getting into this, I mistook this for Baeolus schweinitzii because all I had were, were written descriptions to go on and it sounded kind of like the same thing. Um, and in fact, it, and early on it was, it was called Phaeolus hirsutis before its name was changed. So uh, when I find these, I let them age until they're pretty well dried and rusty, like they are in the bottom left. And it takes a lot of mushrooms to get any color. It's about a ratio of five or six parts dried mushrooms to one part fiber. It's not a very exciting color, but occasionally I will do one because it is a nice neutral peach. And um, just because it's, what, it's the first one that I find in the summer, this will start appearing in sometimes in early July, late June, early July. And then there's this one that, that uh, Miriam Rice used and then discovered colors with the sulfur tufts. And uh, these, again, the color isn't all that exciting if you're used to the yellows from plants, other plants and, and uh, leaves and grasses. It's not terribly exciting, but I like to do one dye pot a year just in honor of Miriam. Um, it's just, it has a sentimental value. And uh, this is one that can't be dried. I discovered through experience, if you let it dry, you get a dull brownie yellow, uh, not very exciting. And also even um, one time I, I made a big dye bath and I kept it for a couple of weeks. I wanted to do a workshop with it. And even then the color was very dull. So it has to be used fresh. And generally here, um, it, I can find it in abundance. This year, strangely enough, I didn't find a lot, but they grow on dead alder, standing or fallen alder here. This one I don't find a lot, but I did find a huge growth of it once on a wood chip pile down the road. And so I picked what I could and dried it. I still have some dried. It gives a yellow, um, perhaps a richer yellow than the sulfur tufts, but I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it since then. And then we have the velvet packs, the Tapinello at Totomentosa. These start appearing in mid-July and they carry on through September, October even. Um, and they grow on dead Douglas fir on the old mossy stumps or the fallen logs. And um, they, they are distinctive in their 
they're uh, brown velvet stems and they grow off center. The two little ones on the top left grew in two weeks time to be the two flat ones on the top right. So they grow fairly quickly. Um, slugs love them. So if I find some baby ones and I want to let them grow, I'll make a little fortress out of sticks and ferns. I'll just pack it all around the mushrooms to keep the slugs away so that they'll have a chance to get big enough to grow. And from this one, if things go well, if, if I'm lucky, I can get a purple from them. Um, more often than not, I will, I will get a brown or that lovely green using an iron mordant. And this is one mushroom that um, one has to be careful with with the temperature. Um, it, and here is where an induction burner is really useful because you have to bring the mushroom up very slowly to cook and watch the temperature. And usually around 150 degrees Fahrenheit, I'll start to see some purple appearing. And at that time, I pull it out of the, out of the dye bath. Um, if you let it get too hot, it will turn brown. And, and this is one that doesn't need a mordant. You actually get the purple with no mordant. And um, yeah, this, this one, you can see the purple is a bit spotty because I put it in with the mushroom. And sometimes I will do that. I'll, I'll put the mushroom in a nylon bag and put the fiber in with it and let it all cook at the same time. And I don't mind if the color isn't uniform. It gives it some interest when I go to spin it later. And then there's the Dyer's polypore. The fail is Schweinitzii. This grows everywhere on Douglas fir, generally on dead fir stumps or logs, um, sometimes on, oh. stand, on standing living trees. Yeah. And uh, Occasionally, I have a few big old giant fir in my back forest um, that have these growing at the base and even 20 or 30 feet up the tree. And I imagine they are still there in that forest because when the loggers saw these mushrooms on them, they knew that the heartwood had been infected and the tree wasn't going to be worth logging. Uh, so it starts out fuzzy and yellow and then it's fun to watch it grow if you can go back and watch them grow they have golden a golden pore surface underneath and then as it gets bigger the uh, the color changes it starts to go brown from the center out but as long as the pore surface is still yellow the color is good um, but as it starts to go brown, the color will turn to a darker sort of brownie gold, not quite so exciting. And then on the bottom left is a mushroom from a previous year. They will turn dry and crispy and they're really not much good for dying at that point, but it's usually a sign that, that there is some wood in the area that might have a new one growing in the next year. They are perennials and so they will appear in the same location for years. And I did an experiment one time. Um, I had heard that maybe they will regrow if you cut them off and I had a, a nurse tree in the forest that was just covered with these. So I decided to try it one time and you can see where I cut the, the yellow edges off it and two weeks later, sure enough, it had regrown. Um, the edges were much thinner than before, but I thought that was quite interesting. I, I don't really do that very often, but it was interesting to experiment with. And this is an example of the colors that you can get from Dyer's Polypore. It's so generous with its color. Um, I, can, I can use the same dye bath several times and as you can see on the top the color does get lighter and lighter but um, you can just get so much color from it and the green yarn on the top is uh, with using an iron mordant and the brown is using copper 
So it, it really does make a lovely range of colors. Uh, the browns on the bottom are from an older specimen. And you can see how by that time you lose the bright gold. Um, on the right is a silk camisole that I had wrapped around a bottle. And then when it was finished dyeing, I brushed the edges with a copper solution. And it made those lovely brown stripes. Um, Dyer's polypore is, is one that can be used for paper making too. I don't do a lot of paper anymore. Um, I just decided it's not for me. But there are some mushrooms here that, that make good paper. Um, primarily, they, they red belted conch. The, uh, this this uh, brown that makes the middle of the bowl and also the brown in the shoes, which are not wearable. They're purely or ornamental. Uh, but that makes a good, strong cardboard-like paper. The paler tan is from the Trimedes versicolor, the, the turkey tails, which makes a lovely textured paper, just a beautiful flecked texture. And then the dark brown is from the Theolus Phoenicii. It's rather more fragile, but makes a good accent color. And for a while, I played with making beads from this paper as well. And, and made some jewelry. Again, I decided that's not for me. It's just a little too fiddly. And I won't go into a lot of detail about making paper. It's, it's essentially the same process as making paper with other materials. Uh, you just have to collect the mushrooms and soak them and run them through a blender until you get a slurry. And I purchased a number of blenders at the thrift shop and I went through a number of them, especially with the red belted conch. It's just so tough. The pieces are like rubber and it really <laughs> worked the blender hard to get it into a, a pulp. But it is, it is a lovely paper. And then we have the lobster mushroom, Hypomyces lactiflorum. These are so distinctive and so hard to miss. And some years um, they just grow in great abundance. And I've had people save them for me because I can use the old mushy ones. Um, in fact, the color from them is even better than I get from the young fresh ones. And for these, um, it's the, the skin, the outer layer that gives the color. The inside is white. And if you put them in whole when they're fresh, the white flesh will tend to absorb some of the color. And so to get maximum use of the color, it's best to shave, shave or pare off the red skin. And I keep it, I set it aside to dry until I have enough to use in the dye pot. Um, these get really smelly uh, as they get old and mushy. They, uh, they have quite a pong to them. And so um, when I spend evenings in my study pairing these mushy lobster mushrooms, I, I'm on a pariah to the rest of the house. I, I have to just uh, keep the door closed. But look at the color it gives. Um, in the middle are, are those first sorry samples that I got when I didn't know what I was doing. But the, the brilliant reds on the top um, the one on the top right came from a very strong dye bath, and I used fresh pairings for that. And that is one dye pot. I, I started, you can see the dark red on the left. I started with that, and I just kept putting yarn in and putting yarn in all the way around until finally it ended up with the pink. And um, that was just such a strong, a strong color. And on the bottom left, you can see you can you can play with this by uh, playing with the pH. So um, here I had I had dyed it first with the lobster and then put it into a, a vinegar bath at pH three, and then on the right I uh, put it into a bath of pH ten using washing soda. 
and you can just see the color change immediately. Um, and so that's fun. And that's fun to do with children to, to show them how the color changes. And then we have the orange cor coral, the various uh, various kinds of Ramaria. This one is tricky. This year I found quite a bit of it and I really didn't do very well with it. But if you're lucky, you get purple. And um, if, when I first started collecting this, I didn't realize that with purple, you have to watch the temperature. And I was trying and trying so many samples and, and Miriam Rice had said in her book that you can get purple with an iron mordant. And I was determined to get it and it just wasn't working until I heard a natural dyer talking about uh, using flowers to get purple and how she had to watch the temperature. And that's when it twigged and so I thought, um, that's what I have to do. And one year the coral was so abundant. Mushrooms everywhere were so abundant. I was bringing piles of them home every day and laying them out to dry on the front porch because the dehydrator was always busy. And I had a mountain of coral on my studio floor. I swear it was, you know, 18 inches tall. I just kept piling it on and piling it all. And it, it dried which I, at the time, I thought was what I wanted it to do. And so finally, when I had time to put some in a dye pot, I tried it and it just, it was just beige, no color at all. Um, I was quite disappointed, of course. And then just toward the end of the season, someone gave me a little brown bag of orange coral and I left it outside and it froze overnight. So the next day I thought, well, I'll just give this one more try. And that's where the silk here uh, went through the dye pot. And I was just, I was so thrilled because finally I got my purple. And that was in 2013. And I still have that silk, even though I can't wear the camisole myself. Um, and it's still purple. It has retained the color this whole time. Um, this scarf on the right is one that I did last year from quite a large amount of, of Romeria that I'd collected. And I got several exhausts from that, meaning that, again, I put wool in a second and third time. And you can see toward the end, it turned gray, but that has stayed purple this whole time too. And then we have the toothed fungi, the Hidnellum. Um, Hidnellum orontiacum grows sometimes in great abundance. It certainly did this year. The last year, I don't think I found any at all. So this year I have quite a lot of it. And along with the others, the Coeruleum and the Pecchii. And I, I keep them separate when I harvest them. I don't get too many of these others, but they could very easily go in a dye bath together. And they give a very nice green, especially with iron, which is um, this one on the right here. That's, that's a really lovely forest green and not with the gold tones that um, when you get green from the dyer's polypore, it tends to be more of a goldy green. And this I think is just a beautiful green. Uh, knitted up, it's, it's not quite so bright. I have a feeling it fades over time. And then we have the sarcodon, the violet hedgehog. This is another one that sometimes I find in abundance, sometimes not. And it will give a blue. I should mention that, that with the hidden alum and also with this one, uh, they need to be cooked at pH 10 if you want to get the blues or bluey greens. And um, you can use ammonia to bring them pH up, although that's quite smelly and has to be cooked outside. Or washing soda also works. Um, you, you have to measure it carefully though. You do need some pH strips to measure the pH because uh, if you go higher than pH 10, it will damage the fiber. Um, and also you have to monitor it throughout the cooking process because the pH will drop during the cooking time. So you always want to keep it 
at, uh, at a higher pH. And this blue tends to fade into a gray green, as you can see on the bottom right. However, that wool on the top is one that I dyed last year and it is still this color. Um, and it hasn't been in perfect shade. It's, it's been on a shelf in, in uh, muted sunlight. So I'll be anxious to see how long that retains its color. And then I, I don't have examples of what happens with the felidon. Um, you treat it the same way you do with the hydnellum. I don't get too many of these and I've sort of been collecting them. So this, this year I'm going to try a dye pot, but again, I will, I will cook it at pH 10 and I will hope for a blue or bluey green. And then the Bolitopsis, um, that's one that I haven't found too much of usually. This year I found a few more and that will give this lovely forest green. It's just a beautiful green. And um, as you can see, when I, when I use the unspun fiber, the color looks lighter because of the airiness of the fiber. But once it's spun up, it will appear much darker. And then we have the dermosa bees, the, the various cortinarias that have the, uh, the bright colored gills. And these appear later in the year. I, in fact, just found a little cluster of them today back in my forest. And I collect these and I separate the caps from the stems and let them dry separately. The stems give a lighter pinky um, coral color and it's the caps that really have the color. And they are so generous with their color. They just give these brilliant reds. And it's interesting because um, the, the color attaches to the fiber within 15 minutes. It just takes no time at all. And the skeins at the top were all from the same dye bath. Um, the red attaches to the fiber first, and then you get more of orange and orange tones uh, with subsequent dye baths. And this is one that can also be modified uh, by adjusting the pH. And this is the lovely one. Only one year did I find this many of the Cortinaria sanguineus, the little dark red ones. Um, I had a little spot behind me where I used to find maybe a dozen or so, and I've instructed my family that's where I want my ashes to be scattered. But I haven't found I haven't found any for a few years, so I don't know what's happened. I keep blowing kisses to the area in hopes. But this it's just such such a generous color. On the top left are more examples of one dye bath. I started with the color on the left. Uh, the second from the left was iron mordanted. And then all of the rest of them were mordanted with alum. And I just kept going and going with it until it looked as if there was no more color. And this is the one that, that grows so abundantly in, in the Scandinavian countries. That's why you see so much red in the Scandinavian pieces. Now, this is one that does not grow here. Um, the Western jack-o'-lantern mushroom is found um, under oak trees. And um, th these came from California. The mushroom dyer extraordinaire, Alyssa Allen, sent me these. If you're there, Alyssa, hello, and thank you again for these. Um, they give a purple. And uh, it was, I, I also learned, this was a learning experience for me too, because I let my first batch go too high and it was a very nice green. But the second batch, I watched the temperature and I got this purple. Um, there's a reason purple is a royal color because it's not very common in the natural world. And uh, the, the first, the first uh, purples were obtained from a little mollusk that grows in the Mediterranean and also off the coast of Mexico. 
and it's very labor intensive and requires a lot of these little creatures to get purple from it. And so that's why it was the kings and queens who got to wear the purple. And this is another one as well. Um, the, this does not grow here as far as I know, the Hopalopilus nidulans or the synonym is rutilans. Um, it's found mostly in Eastern North America and in European countries. Um, Alyssa Allen found one in Northern BC. They grow on birch trees. And so I'm dying to one day find some of these. Um, I bought some of these at one of the symposia in, uh, in Norway. And this is the color it gave me. This is a, a scarf I made with that. And um, it, just, it just kept giving its color and giving and giving of it. And it was just really fun to see how much purple came out of that, that little I'm assuming brown polypore. And so now I'm still playing with colors. Um, I still like seeing how the combinations fit together so well and I enjoy spinning the different things. And so I'm in the middle now of dying this year's harvest of mushrooms and then I will start spinning and waiting for next year to happen. So um, that's the end of my presentation. If there are any questions, um, perhaps you could. Yeah, what, what we're going to do is, Mel has been accumulating any questions on her side on the Facebook page with Jazz. And um, um, we are going to, we've accumulated any questions here on our side. Andre and Kurt have been doing that. And um, so if you haven't already been submitting any questions, you can put them in the chat box. You can take a look at the chat box. That's going to give you all kinds of thank yous for your presentation. I see things coming up. Yes, thank you, everybody. Uh, it was a pleasure. I, I hope you found something interesting. It was very oh, good yeah. indeed, Anne. Yeah, it sounds like someone has a question about bioluminescence, though, and I'm not sure how that would translate into a question. So I don't know if you can actually expand on that one. I can't. Um, I understand that the the Ampholotus is a bioluminescent mushroom, but um, as far as I know, the the light itself is not connected with the actual color molecules. Um, I've never actually seen a bioluminescent mushroom at night, so um, I don't know anything about it. Have I tried dyeing with lichens? Um, I've done some dyeing with lichens. Um, what, one has to be very careful when harvesting these because generally they're very slow growers. Um, they are important for the environment. And um, so I only harvest ones that have been blown to the ground, uh, windfall. And it's not my favorite thing to do. Um, there's a whole different pro process for a lot of them. They have to be fermented in an ammonia solution for several weeks or maybe even months to get the color out of them. And the color that I did get while it was pleasant was um, not that outstanding, no no better than what I can get from mushrooms. So I'm not really going to pursue that much further. But if you go to the Facebook site, Mushroom and Lichen Dyers United, um, which is administered by Alyssa Allen, um, she has a lot of experience with lichens and you can get a lot of information from there. Awesome, so I have a couple questions for you, Anne. Um, Caitlin asks, after you've picked your mushrooms, does it matter for a different species how long you can actually keep them preserved? And do different species have different ways of preserving them that make them produce different colors? It, it generally doesn't matter. Um, mushrooms can last a long time when they're dried. Um, I find it's a good idea to um, after they're dried, to stick them in the freezer for a couple of weeks because I have gone back to bags of dried mushrooms 
and found that half of them are powder because um, little bugs get into them or perhaps were in them when I harvested. Um, it doesn't affect the color really uh, for, for uh, dr drying them. For most of them, I mentioned the ones that, that don't dry well. Um, some people freeze some of them, particularly the dermosibes. Um, they, they'll put them in the freezer. It's thought that that might help break down some of the cell walls and release more color. I haven't actually tried that because I find they have so much color anyway. It hasn't been necessary for me. Um, and, and a lot of times uh, when, when I bought uh, dye mushrooms from other people at the symposia, they've been vacuum sealed. And I think that is a good way to preserve them just to uh, keep the bugs out. Okay, that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, yeah, Kaylin also says it's a wonderful, a lovely presentation. So there oh, you go. Oh, thank you. And Francis also from the Mushroom and Lichen Facebook page says great info. Thank you. Um, and I know you can't see those right now, so I'm showing that up. <laughs> but also, um, have you noticed that there's a difference in color and age of a dehydrated mushroom? Like if, like if you've had it in a package for a couple of years versus using it that same season, does that change the color or not really? I know you might have sort of answered the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, it doesn't seem to. Um, the, the ones that I really have an abundance of in dried form are the Faolus schweinitzii, the Dyer's polypore. And if I picked them when they were fresh, when the flesh was gold, it doesn't seem to make a difference how long they've lasted. I have some that are a few years old and um, I'm still getting good color from them. Excellent. Um, and how do you check the pH level? I think you mentioned strips. Oh, so yes. Like yes, you have to get more pH strips, litmus paper. Um, they, you can get them at some pharmacies if you ask at the pharmacy counter or at uh, science supply stores. Um, Maywa in Vancouver is the, uh, a really good dye, dye material source. They have them. Um, and How probably at M-A-I-W-A. That's a fabulous um, store, several, they have several locations in Vancouver. Uh, they, they aren't open to the public now, but you can still order things online. They have good, and also you can ask at um, shops that supply materials for hot tubs and aquariums, but check, check the numbers on that because sometimes they don't do the full range of pH. They might just be testing for the, the mid range and, and you want pH strips that go all the way from one to 13. Right. Um, so you mentioned pH level and there was a maximum level of pH. Um, is there a maximum level of heat, like temperature for wool? Uh, for wool, uh, yeah, you, you don't really want to boil it. Um, but this is where it's easier to dye yarn that's already been spun. That's more forgiving. Um, and you, you, can, you can put that, you can help get that reaching the boiling point. You don't want to have severe sudden changes of temperature for any wool. If it were to go from boiling into straight cold, even the yarn will felt. Mm. Um, and that, that's what felt makers do actually is change the temperature suddenly. When you're using the unspun wool like I do, you have to be very careful to raise the temperature slowly and don't agitate the wool. Just re resist the urge to stir it very much and then let it cool down slowly. I like to leave it overnight in the dye bath if I can, if I have the, the luxury of time. I will, I will um, soak the mushrooms overnight first before I cook them, let that cool down. And then the next day, put the wool in, bring that up to temperature and then let it sit overnight. So it can go over several days, but that's kinder to the fiber if you have time to do that. That's a great answer. So I hope Janine gets some success with that answer. She's also asking, um, how do you mordant fleece 
is that considered a natural fiber that you would be able to dye with uh, fungi? Or? Yeah, fleece, uh, fleece is the word that's used for fiber taken right off the animal. So generally one thinks of fleece as wool um, okay. and you would mordant it the same way, just um, very carefully, put it into the solution that you've already made. You would dissolve the, the mordanting salts, usually alum in hot water first and put that into a larger pot of water and then put your, your wool into that and then very slowly bring it up to temperature, bring it up to about 160, 170, and um, don't, don't let it boil. Just try to keep it from boiling. Um, quite often when I see it getting up to that temperature, if I'm doing it on a propane burner, it's harder to control. So I'll bring it up to 170 or 180 and then just turn the heat off put the lid on and let it cool overnight. And it seems to work. And actually um, some people don't even cook the, the mordant. Um, people say, I, I haven't tried this yet, but apparently you can just put it into a cold mordanting solution and leave it um, for a while. And, and that's supposed to be good enough. But I, I was taught the old way. And so um, I still do it that way. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> the tried and true, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Jason asks, uh, do you use iron salts or an oxide solution for an iron mordant? Um, I buy the iron powder from Maywa, the dye, the dye supply store. Um, and I'm not sure what its chemical name is. Uh, you can make your own iron solution by putting an old piece of rusty iron into a vinegar solution and just leave it until it turns brown. Um, then you're guessing, you're guessing at it. When, when you're using iron powder, you want to go by weight and 3% uh, is enough for iron. If you go higher than that, that can damage the fiber. Mm -hmm. And I should have mentioned with alum, um, you can go from 10 to 20% by weight of alum. Um, that the higher percentage is is used for the reds generally, but I usually keep it at ten percent, and it seems to work well. It it just helps stabilize the color, and and also uh, with with alum and iron, I put about half the weight of um, cream of tartar in as well, mm -hmm. and especially with iron that. Uh, that just makes it a little easier on the fiber and helps the iron particles mix mix better. Yeah. So with the iron that you could put that into vinegar, I, I've done that personally with copper to try and get mm -hmm. a color. Now that you mentioned that you don't know what kind of percentage it might be of, of strength, um, is there something you recommend for copper then as well? Um, again, I, I did, I did have copper from, um, actually it was a, a scientist who gave me some mm -hmm. copper crystals that I was using. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think you would just go by the color. It's, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, but one thing I learned about if you have a copper solution and you can use these mordants over again, um, and just by what I do is with alum, after I've mordanted one batch, I will add half the amount of alum to the next pot. And then the next pot, I will add half of that again and, and just keep using that same bath over and over. And that can be discarded in your garden or in the forest. Um, copper is different. And a marine biologist told me once, if you have to dispose of copper, it's in solution, put clay into it and the clay will absorb the copper molecules. Then you can safely dispose of the liquid. You still have this clay to deal with, but at least it's not going to leach into the water system. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's a great mm. tip. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that's all I've got right now. Jazz, did you have any extra comments or questions? Did you find anything? Uh, no, I posted my own question actually in the chat here. 
uh, regarding a mushroom that I found this summer at the art gallery. Oh, I, just, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's a Boletus polcarimus, uh, which was very intriguing. It was yellow and then, or it was red cap, yellow flesh turned indigo blue on bruising. And I was so intrigued with that color. And I was wondering if you've ever used that one. Um, I I don't use boletes to dye with. I think I think it's because I'm so blessed with all the other dye mushrooms. Um, and and the boletes people use the spongy pore bits and get a yellow or gold from it. But I have no trouble getting getting gold from the mushrooms I find. So I guess I'm a bit of a snob that way. Um, I I don't pick the boletes. <laughs> But you could. I mean, it's certainly worth a try. If you want to try them, I would, I would go ahead and give it a try. You'd process it the same way and see what you get. So it sounds like you have a lot of passion for the Cortinaria species. Or oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Is there another fungus that you really would like to sort of find again and enjoy again besides, I guess, the, uh, the jack-o'-lantern and some other purples, I guess? Um, I'm always excited with the Sarcodon fuscoe indicus because mm -hmm. it's it. Some years I don't find any, so when I do, it's a special one. Um, and to have a lot of a uh, has seems to be a bit of a a teenager, like a temperate. <laughs> Okay. It's very finicky, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Temperamental, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, is there any tips that you've been able to find? I know you talked about it a little bit, but what is it that you found with the with the velvet hedgehog that, or the purple hedgehog that, yeah, allows it to get that beautiful blue out of it? Um, again, I raised the pH to 10. Um, I, I like to soak them overnight at pH 10. I don't know if I've never done tests to see if it makes a difference, but I just think if I'm going to soak it overnight anyway, might as well soak it at, at that. And then, um, in Miriam Rice's book, she does say that ammonia tends to bring out the blues mm. more than the wash washing soda does. So, because I can cook outside. I'll use ammonia. Um, when I cook at pH 10, it's important to, to, rinse, to rinse your fiber when it's mm -hmm. out uh, because it is, even at that level, it's harsh on the fibers. Mm -hmm. and, and oh, and one thing I discovered with the, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, when I got that lovely purple out of that, I had, I had sample strands that I had put in the dye pot and Thankfully, I decided to just test the washing methods to see because when I put one in water, it washed out, it turned gray. And um, it turned gray with, with uh, soap, with a mild soap. So the only thing that kept the color was vinegar, to put it in a vinegar bath. So um, I, I keep meaning to put a note with the scarf I've made so that when when the time comes for my family to to clear out the house, they know that you, you can't wash this one. <laughs> I think Thor has a question. Hi, uh, thank, first of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I was absolutely mm -hmm. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, what I wanted to ask is um, what you're using uh, modern chemicals, but they have uh, equivalents in older times. I'm wondering mm. if you've seen any research how far back this business of dyeing wool and other fibers, uh, medieval times, for example, or even earlier, the people mm. I'm sure would like something other than the white of the sheep or the black of sheep, uh, <laughs> colors of things. So, so uh, how, how far back do you how think the mushroom goes? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's fairly recent. Okay. Um, I think it, it, you know, I, I know it really, people began to be aware of it in the sixties. 
Yeah. I don't know. And that would be something, the next symposium I go to, I will ask the Scandinavian uh, registrants if they know anything about that. Oh, and you know what I forgot to mention too, is that we were to have met this year, 2020 in Port Townsend, Washington. And Lisa Allen and her, her crew were putting together a uh, some fine plans for meeting there and of course that had to be postponed so that's why we haven't met since 2018. Yeah yeah wonderful yeah so um I, lichens I know seem to go back quite a ways as a use. Yeah the yeah. The reds in Scandinavia I know Scandinavians like the red a lot. Mm -hmm. that, that also have a more ancient history. Yes I, I don't really know I I haven't I haven't looked into that topic that much. I I know people are trying to get black using the ancient methods because I believe in medieval times they were able to get black. And of course, if you go back to the old tapestries, um, there are colors there that they used. Um, the cochineal and madder were great ones for reds and and the indigo. Yeah. And yeah, and I think lichen dyes do go back quite a long way. And I, I would love to know how they discovered that mm -hmm. soaking lichen in urine would bring out the color. <laughs> so yeah. it must have been another happy accident. <laughs> <laughs> now, Matt, are you, is that good, Thor? Was that your question? Uh, no, I, I guess I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking, oh, and then uh, one other minor question, which you kind of talked around, is the persistence of these colors. Uh, mm -hmm. When you make your fabrics, do you store them in the dark or do you keep them in a dry place or is it is it exposing them to air or UV light? Uh, like what, what seems to break down the colors? Um, it's, it's primarily direct sunlight, like, like any commercial color. Um, the commercial dyes on today's garments will fade in the sunlight. Right. Um, yeah, but per, these colors are are pretty fast, except for the ones that I mentioned that do that do tend to fade over time. Some of the blues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. If there's no more questions, I think we'll wrap up the night. But before we leave, I just. Uh, Mel, I'll be handing over yeah. you to you, but uh, okay, yeah. just remember this is the last presentation of the year, and we don't have one for January. I'm thinking of an option, um, but I'll have to discuss that with the speakers committee, and um, I'll let you all all know. But um, and that was terrific. One, oh. I'm going to ask the last question. Is there a compendium <laughs> of all your formulations, Anne? Um, it, I cover most of this in my book, right, Magic great. in the Dye Pot. And if you go to my blog, um, you can see how to order it there. It's $25 Canadian plus shipping and handling. And That's how pretty good. Order it from you directly. You can order it directly through the blog, and you can use PayPal for that. Uh, and, and the PayPal link actually, you have the choice when you go to it to go to Visa as well without starting up a PayPal account. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We right. Can do that. I just want to make that clear to everybody. <laughs> <Just Thank you. laughs> Mel, will you wrap up, please? Yeah, well, this has been a wonderful AGM, uh, even though we don't get to see everyone in person. So thank you, Anne, though, for participating and educating us about fungi in a completely different way. Um, yeah, it's been Oh, fantastic. it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. And, and okay. I'll be giving you a call tomorrow as well. Okay. All right? Very good. All the best. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Stay Bye -bye. well. Great. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>